Okay, so new CPUs are just around the corner as we know, and I'm currently redoing all of my CPU benchmarks with a GTX 1080 Ti and 3200 megahertz RAM, and of course, all the new updates and drivers which have been coming out. And there's one CPU that has stood out to me quite a bit, and that's the i5-8400. Now, it's been out for a few months now, so what's the big deal? Well, according to this chart and also some leaks online, Intel has more affordable chipsets on the way, such as B360. And so the locked Core i5-8400 is more relevant right now than ever, because we will soon be able to pair it with a sensible motherboard option, and not just Z370, which is targeted towards enthusiasts, and makes no sense whatsoever to buy a locked CPU with a unlocked motherboard. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, let me rewind a few months. Back in early October last year, Intel released their new lineup of Coffee Lake CPUs. These 8th gen processors were a significant leap compared to the incremental gains we've seen in previous generations. And most notably, we're getting a 2 core bump compared to each CPU from 7th generation, which turned out to be a pretty big deal. For both production workloads and gaming, there were significant gains across the board, however things were a little bit complicated. For whatever reason, whether Intel were rushed to the market market to quickly answer back from the success of AMD's Ryzen processors, or if this was actually planned, Intel only released their enthusiast chipset Z370 along with all of these new 8th generation CPUs, including the i3s. Now this is no big deal if you were planning on buying an unlocked processor such as the 8600K or 8700K since a Z370 motherboard is required for overclocking at the end of the day, but if you were planning on grabbing the new quad core i3 8100 or the new 6 core i5-8400, this was kind of hard to justify. The cheapest Z370 boards at the moment are right around 110 US dollars or so, which I guess isn't too bad if you were planning on getting the i5-8400, but the point here is that on these boards you are paying a premium for the ability to overclock and you will be losing value elsewhere on the board. Now some of you may be thinking, no worries, I'll buy a budget Z370 board, an i3-8100 and then down the road I can upgrade to an 8700K. But the problem with these cheaper Z370 boards are despite being branded as Z370 and sort of targeted towards overclocking, they're not actually recommended for overclocking by the majority of the community. Most of the time you're only getting 4 VRM phases for the CPU which is not really enough for an 8700K or an 8600K for that matter. Uh, and the MOSFETs and chokes which make up the VRM phases are usually pretty poor in terms of efficiency as well. And so personally, I think that buying one of these cheaper Z370 boards with upgradability in mind, uh, for example, planning to use an 8700K down the road, uh, is sort of going to waste and it's kind of flawed thinking because you're not really gonna get any uh, you know productive use out of an 8700K on those boards anyway. And so it really sucks if you were planning to buy uh, you know, an i3-8100 and then use the same budget Z370 board uh, you know, for an 8700K or something like that down the road. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Now, of course, this is even more relevant with the i3-8100, which offers a great amount of performance for just 117 US dollars. But again, there's not really any sensible boards on the market for this CPU at the time of filming, which is a real shame. The reason why I think the i5-8400 is a big deal is the amount of value that it comes with. Value that is soon to be increased when the B360 boards are eventually released. Here we're getting a flat 6 cores running at a rather slow base frequency of 2.8 GHz but a boost clock of 4 GHz. Now Intel state that this is a single core boost clock and during my testing I saw that the 6 core boost was more like 3.8 or 3.9 GHz. Other important notes are the 9 MB of level 3 cache and a TDP of 65 watts. In terms of pricing, an MSRP of $187 I think is fairly reasonable for what you're getting here and thankfully you can actually pick it up for that price unlike some other PC hardware at the moment. Now, I would be foolish not to consider what Team Red have to offer in the same price bracket, and several months before, Intel brought us the i5-8400, 
AMD brought us the Ryzen 5 1600, which packs a serious punch. Simply put, if you were building a gaming PC in 2017 within a reasonable budget, and you wanted great gaming performance and also solid multi-thread performance as well, this was the processor to get, and still today is the top option for many builders. We're getting six cores, 12 threads, and in most cases, you can overclock the Ryzen 5 1600 to around four gigahertz if you've got a half decent motherboard and were somewhat lucky in the silicon lottery. I've thrown the Ryzen 5 1600 into a few builds at this point, uh, I use it for case testing as well for thermals uh, and I've got to say I'm really happy with the performance that it offers and I can definitely see why it is the go-to CPU for a lot of people. Speaking simply on facts though, Intel still has the upper hand when it comes to pure gaming performance, something that we'll look at in just a little bit. And since the i5-8400 is becoming a more relevant choice with the B360 motherboards hopefully upon us quite soon, we're going to see just how it stacks up today against a few other popular options. Now, as I said in the beginning, all testing was done over the last few days with the latest drivers and updates. We're also using 3200 MHz memory on both the Intel and AMD side of things just to make things fair. And of course, for the CPU testing, we will be using a GTX 1080 Ti. We will also be looking at synthetic benchmarks and production workloads after the gaming results, but for now, let's look at how the performance was in PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds. Now, it's important to note that this game has a 144 FPS cap, and with the usual testing done at 1080p, pretty much all CPUs would be hitting that with a 1080 Ti, so we've bumped it up to 1440p, so we're not bottlenecked by the game itself. Here, the i5-8400 is landing itself in the middle of the chart, but is within two to three FPS of a stock 8700K. Now, when it comes to PUBG, single threaded performance is pretty much the end game here. And unfortunately, that's why we're seeing the Ryzen processors towards the bottom of the charts. Also worth mentioning, the i3-8100 is giving us some pretty solid value for $115. In Rainbow Six Siege though, there's not a massive difference between any of the processors in the stack at all. Ryzen processors seem to be doing pretty well with the overclock R7 1700 giving us the best result for the lowest 1% of frames. And despite the negligible difference between each CPU, I will still be leaving this in for the future testing for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it's a fairly popular game. And secondly, because it also highlights that in some games, there's just not going to be a massive difference. Battlefield 1 on the other hand is a completely different story with about a 65 FPS difference between the i3-8100 at the bottom of the chart and the overclocked 8700K at the top at 192.3 FPS. This is one test case where the i5-8400 really proves itself as incredible value against other options like the overclockable 8600K and 8700K, especially when you factor in the difference in the motherboard pricing. Switching gears, let's look at Civilization 6, starting with the built-in graphics benchmark. Now, arguably anything above 70 to 80 FPS is going to give you a fairly fluid gaming experience, but of course with the PC Master Race, more is always better. This game seems to love a nice blend between high multi-threading performance and also a high clock speed. What's interesting here is that the two mid-tier processors under $200 that a lot of people have their eyes on, the R5-1600 and the i5-8400, are giving us pretty close performance when the R5-1600 is overclocked to 3.9 gigahertz. In the AI test for Civilization 6, we're looking at the average turn time here with the i5-8400 giving us an average of 11.4 seconds per turn turn and the R5-1600 with 11.97. So a very similar result to what we saw in our graphics benchmark previously. In Witcher 3, there's not a significant difference at all between the top five scores in terms of average frame rate, but there is when we're talking about the lowest 1%. Here, the i5-8400 is clearly the best value option with average FPS pretty much on par with the overclocked 8700K, and the 1% lower result of 77.6 isn't too bad either. For The Division, the i5-8400 again is pretty much on par with the overclocked i5 and i7 at the top of the stack, with the i3-8100 also not far behind here with an average FPS of 132.9. Here, the lower single-threaded performance on the Ryzen 5 1600 and the R7 1700 does hold them back a bit by about 10 to 15 FPS on average. 
For AI intensive games like GTA 5, the i5-8400 does hold its own here against its bigger brothers with an average FPS of 119.6, so about 3.5% within the top score but for a significantly lower price. In this particular game, it's honestly hard to recommend something like the overclockable i5-8600K or even the 8700K for that matter when the i5-8400 is hitting the mark for a fraction of the cost. That extra $200 to $300 or so could easily be put towards more powerful PC hardware, for example, a better GPU. And lastly, Ghost Recon Wildlands further demonstrates this point with the i5-8400 only a few FPS behind some of the most powerful gaming processors that you can buy right now. Now, as you can probably see, the R5-1600, which is roughly the same price as the i5-8400, does match it in some games, but for the most part, you will see about a 10% slower result in favor of the i5. Of course, though, there's a lot of other things that we do outside of gaming, and I'm aware that people are using these mid-range processors for multi-threaded tasks and production workloads as well. So what is the performance like there? Well, starting off with Cinebench R15 using all threads available, the R5-1600 shows us that it's an absolute multi-threading beast when it's compared to the Core i5, and most of you know this because it has 6 cores and 12 threads, whereas the i5-8400 only has 6 cores and 6 threads. When restricting the test to a single thread, however, the i5-8400 does have a significantly better score, even when the Ryzen 5 1600 is overclocked to 3.9 GHz, and this is a great indicator to why we see the i5 have a superior performance when it comes to gaming. For file compression and decompression using the 7-zip benchmark, the i5-8400 and the Ryzen 5 1600 are pretty close when it comes to compression only, but for decompression, the Ryzen CPU does take a significant lead, one which is stretched further once overclocked. It's also interesting to see here that across the board, the Intel CPUs perform best with compression, whereas the Ryzen CPUs are significantly better for decompression. And finally, let's look at how the i5-8400 does when it comes to video editing in Adobe Premiere Pro. Starting off with encoding times with a 1080p file, and here we're getting slightly better performance than the stock 7700K and the Ryzen 5 1600, and we're also a few seconds within the stock 8-core Ryzen 7 1700. Of course though, all three of those processors can be overclocked, which improves the performance significantly, and as a result the Ryzen 5 1600 overclocked to 3.9GHz does export the file about 21 seconds faster. With a 4K file though, encoded at a higher bitrate, we do see the i5-8400 take the lead and show us that high single-threaded performance is relevant with file encoding. And with these specific settings, ones that I would typically use to prepare a file for YouTube, the i5-8400 is a good deal quicker than both the Ryzen 7 1700 and the R5-1600, even when they're both overclocked. Performance on the video editing timeline though is a different story, with the multi-threading performance of the Ryzen and CPUs clearly benefiting quite a bit here, dropping virtually no frames at all and making for a buttery smooth timeline experience, compared to the i5-8400 which is dropping over 30% of frames during playback. And lastly, video stabilization via the warp stabilizer effect was fairly quick on the i5-8400, about 17 seconds quicker than the overclocked Ryzen 5 1600, and that time definitely adds up when considering an entire video project, not just 25 seconds that we see in the benchmark. Okay, so full gaming, the i5-8400 was hot on the heels of the overclocked 8600K and even the 8700K as well, and compared to its direct competitor, the Ryzen 5 1600, it was about 10% faster, uh, even when that was overclocked to 3.9 gigahertz. Now, I'm well aware that AMD have been brewing up the second generation Ryzen CPUs named Pinnacle Ridge. We should be able to see those around mid-April or around May, according to some leaks, and it'll be very interesting to see how they stack up to uh, Coffee Lake CPUs in gaming, and I'd personally like to see a direct competitor to the i5-8400, which as we've seen is pretty much insane value for the price. So if you were planning on building a gaming PC, uh, you know, as soon as possible, I would definitely wait at least a month or two to see, uh, you know, where everything settles. On the Intel side of things, it'd be very interesting to see if these B360 motherboards are worth it in terms of price to performance. And on the AMD side of things, of course, uh, Ryzen 2, I think is gonna be huge. Uh, I'd love to see clock speeds up to 4.3 or 4.4 gigahertz. 
I think at that point, we're going to have exceptional performance in gaming. And so let me know down below, uh, after seeing the results of the i5-8400 in gaming, would you be planning to pick up a B360 board along with the i5, uh, you know, and have that sort of budget combo? Or will you be waiting for the Ryzen 2 CPUs uh, to hit the market and see what's on offer there? Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, guys. And as always, I will see you all in the next one.